Greetings Church and welcome to this final chapter in our series on apologetics. I'm sure you can agree it has been enlightening and it is my prayer that the Lord has equipped his saints to not only defend the truth but also to contend for our faith in modern society. The truth is always under threat and unless we as the church stand and defend it, we'll continue to see the moral standards dropping all around us in our homes, in our schools and sadly even within the church. As Jude says in his letter, let us contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. And I know today I speak to fellow resolute believers in Christ, but yet when it comes to apologetics, so often we think that this is just for the frontline soldiers, you know, the, the commandos or the guys who go behind enemy lines and throwing grenades behind enemy lines, you know, that kind of thing. But really the truth is that we're all called to defend the faith. Whether we're young, whether we're old, we're all called to defend the, tra the, the faith. And this is in our workplaces, in our communities, in our country, even within our homes and amongst our family. So no one is exempt from this. It's something that we're all called to. So let us take every opportunity that is presented before us to glorify the name of God and to lift up and defend His truth. So let me just open in a word of prayer. Lord God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this blessed message of your Son, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit comes and embellishes it. Your Holy Spirit comes and makes the, the, the soil fertile, Lord God, as this message lands on your people. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's message is about what is probably the most foundational, the most fundamental belief we have as Christians. Today's message is on the resurrection or evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into the actual evidence, it's important to appreciate the significance of this event. It's no understatement to say that the whole of Christianity hinges on just this single event. Now, why would I say something like that? Well, the truth is, if Jesus is not the risen Son of God, that is the resurrected Son of God, then our whole faith begins to fall flat. Everything that we have believed, we have received from Jesus Christ. So if, it, if he's not the risen son of God, then we've believed a complete hoax. I like how C.S. Lewis, uh, the well-known Christian author and apologist, puts it in his seminal work, Mere Christianity, a book that I highly recommend to anyone who's, who's really interested in apologetics. I am trying here, and this is him talking about Jesus, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I love this passage or this, this quote because it just speaks to the significance of the event of Jesus. Jesus, everything that he said, everything that he did, the crucifixion, the resurrection, if he is the son of God, he, well, it's one or the other. He's either the son of God or he was a liar. So we have to make that choice. And if he is the son of God, it has a massive, massive ramifications for us in terms of our choices in this world. So everything that we hold to as doctrine, everything that we believe in terms of Christian ethics, everything that we believe in terms of the Christian worldview, it'll all fall flat because we understand, we have understood and received all of these things through Jesus Christ. Listen to how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 17. And if Christ has not been raised, literally the exact point of this message, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's how significant this is. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is irrelevant. And we are living in a life filled with sin and we are living in a life with no future hope. So as it continues, then those who have also those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, 
we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have, been, who have fallen asleep. For as a, by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. What a blessed future hope we have to look to as a result of our Savior's sacrifice. So if Jesus didn't die from the dead, our whole religion begins to fall flat. Now, before we actually look at any evidence, let's also consider what Jesus had to say about his crucifixion and resurrection. And the first thing that we see is that he actually prophesied this. So in, in no uncertain terms, he actually predicts these events, as we'll see here in Mark 9, verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed... After three days, he will rise. Notice as well that whenever Jesus spoke, often he would use parables or stories or metaphors. But here he's using plain, transparent language. He's saying to his disciples, and it's a, that's the reason why he's using plain language, is he's saying to his disciples, this is a matter of fact. I want you to be clear that this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill me. And when I'm killed, after three days, I will rise. No ambiguity. In Luke 9.22 we read as well, he was uh, speaking to his disciples again, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now Jesus also explains the, the reason for the resurrection, or the reason for the crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, in John 3 verse 14 to 16, this famous passage, And as Moses lifted up, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the man, the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So just as the, as the Israelites, as we read in uh, the Old Testament, the Israelites, the, the judgment of God was upon them for their sin. And there were snakes that were biting them and killing them. And Moses had to raise up a serpent, a golden serpent, on a pole. And the only way that they would receive healing was by looking upon that snake, uh, or that serpent upon that pole. And in the same way, in the New Testament, Jesus is raised up on a pole. And as we look to Him, as we stand condemned in our sin, as we look to Him, we receive life. It's a beautiful picture of this, uh, a beautiful pre-image of what's, what's to happen in the New Testament. So the disciples also understood this um, following the resurrection. I'll say that because beforehand, of course, they didn't understand. But following the resurrection, listen to what uh, Peter had to say. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I are born again to a living hope. What a beautiful picture to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So even today we receive this wonderful promise. So quite simply, the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that it is the very means by which we have received the gift of eternal life. Apart from this event, we have no future. Apart from this event, we have no hope. Apart from this event, our life here on earth is all that we have, and it'll, it's all that we will ever have. So... When we talk about crucifixion or the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, understand that this is not just an apologetics topic. It's actually the very crux of our faith. You know, the word crux and crucifixion have the same Latin root for a reason. Crux meaning the most important thing. Crucifixion, the most important thing. So this is the foundation, the rock upon which we have built our lives. If there is but a single defense that we want to make for the Christian faith, this is the one. Let it be written on our very hearts because our Savior is worthy of nothing less. In Romans 4.25, He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. So Jesus defeated death on the cross of Calvary. And He did so willingly. And He did so for you and for me. And in doing so, He broke the stranglehold of sin and death over us forever. And also in doing so, he fulfilled countless prophecies, including his own ones that we just 
uh, went over now, but also many other ones that we've covered throughout this, this series on apologetics. So uh, the message on the historicity of the Bible or the message on why Christianity is the one true religion. So not to discredit prophecies, but the, so prophecies, of course, carry immense weight in terms of evidence of the resurrection and evidence of Jesus' divinity. But today we're going to focus on other evidences for the resurrection. In Psalms, listen to how faithful our God is. In Psalms 16, verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. How faithful is our steadfast God in fulfilling His promises. That was in the Old Testament that He spoke those words, speaking of His Son, speaking of His Holy One. So just to make it clear, the resurrection is of course crucial or central to our Christian faith, but other significant events like Jesus' incarnation, his, uh, re his crucifixion, and his um, ascension are also fundamental. But the resurrection itself uniquely confirms Jesus' divinity, ensures the efficacy of his atoning sacrifice, and provides the foundation for Christian hope and the promise of eternal life. Now, one of the beautiful things about the Bible and the, indeed the resurrection of Jesus as well, is that it's something that can be tested. It's falsifiable. Biblical scholars of all kinds of beliefs or of all kinds of worldviews can take a look at the facts and the history surrounding this event and draw their own conclusions. Obviously, as Christians, we have our own view, but you can be a completely neutral or take a completely skeptical, neutral view of these events and draw your own conclusion or you can even take an antagon antagonistic view of all of these things. So imagine that you take the Gospels as purely historical documents. We say that they're purely historical records of some events, one of which is the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now can you do this objectively and conclude that it's all true? Well, interestingly enough, the vast majority of historical scholars do indeed come to that exact conclusion, and we'll cover some of the reasons for why they do so. Now, at the outset, it's key to stress that when you're trying to confirm the historical authenticity or the historical reliability of something, when you, have, when you can draw upon various independent sources that all confirm the same thing, and some of which are dated very close to the original event, then you have compelling evidence to believe that it's true. So to make this defense of the faith or this defense of the resurrection of Jesus as, as simple to internalize and remember as possible, I've split this into just four simple reasons. The first one is the empty tomb. So the first evidence of Jesus being resurrected from the dead is, of course, the empty tomb. And we know this from Scripture, as we read in John 20, verse 1 to 9. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. I love Peter. He's just my favorite person in scripture. He just went straight in. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So where it says, uh, that John saw and believed. He's, it doesn't mean he saw and believed that Jesus had been resurrected. It's, it means he saw and believed what Mary had told him, that the tomb was empty. So some interesting things to consider here now. Firstly, where, what happened to the body? Where was it taken? Or, or what, was the, what actually caused the body to be gone? And the first thing we look at is that the chief priests and the Pharisees actually went to um, Pilate and asked for certain precautions to be put in place, including an armed guard and a seal on the tomb. In Matthew 27, verse 62 to 66, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, 
We remember how, it's funny how they will say, Sir, to Pilate, but they will call Jesus the imposter. It's just an interesting thing. So we remember that that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a God of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So they literally said, we need to put precautions in place to actually prevent Jesus' body from being stolen. So this implied that for anyone to be able to make it into the tomb, firstly you would have to break through a Roman guard. Now Roman soldiers are not... uh, are not to be trifled with. Roman soldiers were very well disciplined, very uh, hardcore, very brutal sort of soldiers. Not the kind of people you find falling asleep uh, whilst on guard. Um, also to mention that, you know, if you did fall asleep, you would be executed. <laughs> so, yeah, not the kind of people that would fall asleep and not the kind of people you want to trifle with. But even if you made it through the guard, you would still have to move a tombstone, which in those days weighed about 2,000 kgs, And even if you move the tombstone, you would still have to break a Roman seal. Now, uh, breaking a Roman seal was for all intents and purposes a capital crime because it was considered treason against the Roman Empire. So again, punishable by death. Now, when you consider all of that and you say the, the disciples, you know, bless them, they were certainly not in a position to undertake this or to do this kind of thing, to go and save Jesus. So... If you think about, um, firstly, the, for them, they, would, they had just, a few verses earlier, we had just read that they were afraid and fled for their lives following Jesus' arrest. And now they would have to um, undertake this difficult quest, knowing the, the fact that there's these consequences like death, and also that they were in a state of confusion and fear and loss after what had just happened. So it's highly, highly improbable that it was the disciples that went and did this. And also we see, interestingly, a a few verses further down that the chief priests actually go about trying to cover up this whole thing of of the, the, the tomb being empty. In Matthew 28, verse 11, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Literally the exact thing that they put, the precautions were put in place specifically to prevent this from happening. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And I dare say this story has been told even to today because people still like to believe this story that the body was stolen. So undoubtedly the body was actually out of the tomb, but not stolen by the disciples. The chief priest actually had to, they didn't know how to handle this. They had to think, well, what do we do to actually process this? So, so think about this for a second. If the body was still in the tomb, it would have been a simple matter, of course, for either the Romans or the uh, chief priests or Pharisees to actually be able to just present the body and say, hey, this body was never removed from the tomb. Here it is. And yet, in all of history, <laughs> there is absolutely no historical record of that. There isn't even a denial from the Jewish leaders that Jesus, um, that the tomb was empty. And another interesting thing to think about here is that it's significant or it's profound that Joseph of Arimathea was the person who took Jesus' body and buried it. And this is something that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. So it's not just a once-off sort of thing, it's in all four of the Gospels. So um, Joseph was actually a member of the council, a member of the same people, the same group who had just made the decision to execute Jesus. Although we see he, he didn't actually consent to the decision, but nevertheless he was afraid of the Jews and part of the council. So understand as well that at this point in time, the early church or these disciples would have been very, or would have held a great deal of resentment towards the same group for what they had done. And it it almost seems ludicrous or illogical to think that they would then spin a story that requires one of these council members being the one that buries their Lord. It's almost like an embarrassment. 
So we read this in Luke 23, verse 50 to 53. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their action and count, uh, and act, action, their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And we actually see that it wasn't just him, it was actually Nicodemus as well. Uh, both of them members of the Jewish council or the Sanhedrin. Then he went, he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid it in a tomb cut out in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. So obviously this doesn't mean him physically doing it. It means his, because he was a wealthy man, as we read, it would have been his servants doing this. So it's significant that Joseph of Arimathea was the one to bury Jesus because it adds a detail to this whole resurrection story that would never made it would never make sense if the whole thing was a hoax. Why would the disciples allow, or why there's many reasons why would the disciples allow someone who's part of the council to bury their Lord? But also why would the the Pharisees, having one of their members bury the, the, the bury Jesus, then allow the body to be stolen? Now, here's an uh, interesting quote from a secular historian. Let me stress that, a secular historian. So it does not believe in Jesus or does not believe in Christianity. His name is Michael Grant. And I quote, The historian cannot justifiably deny the empty tomb. According to the evidence, it is irrefutable that there was an empty tomb. If we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary sources, then the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. Isn't that amazing? So a secular historian can look at the facts and draw that sort of conclusion that it is irrefutable that there was an empty tomb. That's amazing. Okay, so point number one, empty tomb. Point number two, the eyewitness accounts. So the the fact that the gospels themselves are written by eyewitnesses is obviously significant in terms of the historical credibility of the the gospels but apart from that the eyewitness accounts of the people who actually saw the risen lord are even more significant now the first thing is that it's profound that the very first eyewitnesses were actually women the two marys at this point in time woman's testimony was completely absolutely disregarded and I mean, you don't have to take my word for that. We can read from Jewish uh, historian Josephus. This is what he has to say in Antiquities of the Jews, book 4, chapter 8. But let not the testimony of women be admitted in, in court on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. Glad he said it and not me. <laughs> this was in the context of the legal and societal norms of the Jewish people at that particular time. So it would be a grave mistake to point to female eyewitnesses when you're trying to establish credibility for your, for your story, if you will. And yet this is something recorded in not one, not two, not three, but all four of the Gospels. It's crazy. So another thing to think about is that a lot of people like to put forth the argument, no, the, the disciples were actually just hallucinating. Or at this point in history, people didn't actually understand what hallucinations were or visions or... Um, apparitions, these kind of things. <laughs> but listen, guys, I think we all can appreciate that anyone at that point in time knew what a hallucination was, knew what a vision was, knew what a ghost was. I mean, we see in the Old Testament even, um, when Saul actually called up Samuel's ghost uh, and communicated with him. So it's not a foreign thing. And, and it brings me to a really important point that when Jesus was resurrected, it's so significant that he was resurrected physically and not resurrected as a spirit. Because think about it, if, if Jesus had come as a spirit, you know, people could look at that and say, okay, well, you know, it's his spirit communicating to us from the dead, which is one thing. But he, he did the miraculous thing and came back physically, physically whole after being crucified. So imagine, he, he actually said to Thomas and the other disciples, you know, come and feel the holes in my hands. Come and feel the hole in my side. Literally come and feel that I'm physically here. I mean, for goodness sake, he ate breakfast with them. <laughs> he ate fish with them and the fish didn't just disappear, you know. So he was physically there. He performed an absolute, it, it could only have been a miracle from God above that he was alive. 
And, you know, add to this the fact that um, Paul actually mentions the 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus at the same time. So where have you ever seen 500 people having the same hallucination at the same time? I know I certainly haven't. In fact, you would say that the person who's making such a ludicrous statement is actually the real person having a hallucination. And also, you know, Paul says, these guys are still alive. You can go and speak to them yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Go and ask them yourself. So it's, it's significant in that sense. And it means that we can dismiss this whole hallucination story. Another really cool thing is that, and this is really profound, guys, is that Jesus appeared to his brother James. Why is this so profound? Because James and Jesus' brothers didn't actually believe in him until after his resurrection. In John 7 verse 3. So his brothers, this is before the resurrection or before the crucifixion. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples may your disciples also may see the works you are doing, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So they actually thought that he was all about the fame. You know, he was trying to show himself, uh, try to become popular with the world. And then the last part, for not even his brothers believed in him. So important point, his brothers didn't believe in him. Now, for those of you that have brothers, I have a brother. What would it take for you to believe if your brother came to you and said, you know, I am God, I am the son of God, I'm God incarnate. What would it take for you to believe such a statement? And not only to believe such a statement, but to believe such a statement to the extent that you're going to die for it, because that's exactly what happened to James. Again, from Josephus and Antiquities of the Jews, we read, he was martyred. It says, Festus was now dead and Albinus was upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So think about that, guys. He didn't believe in Jesus. Jesus got crucified, and somehow he then becomes one of the chief pillars of the Christian church and goes to the extent of being martyred or being stoned to death because he believes in Jesus. What do you think happened? There's only one thing that happened. He saw the risen Lord. So we have Jesus appearing to the apostles multiple times. We have Jesus appearing to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We have Jesus appearing to the, the woman, to Peter, to Paul, to James, and of course to those 500 eyewitnesses all at the same time. Now these are written in different books by different authors. So immense evidence for Jesus having been resurrected. Here's another quote from another secular historian, and I, I just love how even secular historians can look at these things and objectively say, you know what, we can't deny the truth. So here, he qu the quote from Gerd Ludemann is, It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Amazing. So that's point number two. Point number one, empty tomb. Point number two, the eyewitness accounts. Point number three, the transformation of the disciples. So something happened that radically changed the disciples, and now we want to look at what that is. Now the first thing to consider is that the disciples, as any good Jew would, believed that the coming Messiah was meant to come and liberate them from Roman rule and to establish his kingdom upon the earth. He was meant to be this victorious, conquering king. We see this as well in, in terms of how they relate to Jesus, how they, they keep expecting him to come and vanquish his enemies. They keep expecting him to come and bring down, rain down fire from heaven. And whenever he talks about having to be killed or having to be uh, crucified, they don't really understand that because that's not what they were expecting. And as well, Jewish people believed in resurrection, of course, but they believed in resurrection at the end of time, the final resurrection. As far as doctrine and theology go, there was no concept of someone rising from the dead prior to that time. So as far as they were concerned, when Jesus died on the cross, that was it. Their Savior was dead. It was game over as far as they were concerned. The person that they had placed so much hope in was now dead. And we see that in the, their sorrowful reactions to the crucifixion as well. So here's some passages that cover their understanding of the death and resurrection prior to the crucifixion. In Matthew 16, verse 22, 
And Peter took him aside and, and began to rebuke him. Uh, you see, this is why I love Peter, because he's just, <laughs> he's just a very real sort of person, you know. I can't wait for one day to stand in heaven with, <laughs> with Peter and ask him, you know, what were you doing? You were rebuking Jesus. But anyway, this is when Jesus had just said, you know, I have to go to, I have to be killed. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Mark 9, 32. But they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. So when he explained that he has to be crucified, they were afraid. They didn't understand it. And Jesus actually rebukes them after the resurrection in Luke 24, verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ suffer these things and enter into his glory? So basically telling them, look, the prophecies and the Old Testament actually spoke to exactly this. But they, of course, didn't understand that until subsequently, until the Holy Spirit revealed all that truth to them. And you know, something else that's so profound about the cross is that Jesus was literally hanging on the cross as a man cursed by God. And the disciples would have known this because in Deuteronomy, like look at this passage in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, amongst the the law, in Deuteronomy 21 verse 22, If someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, or some 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 translations say tree, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. So think about that. The disciples were looking upon their Savior, the person that they believed as the Savior, as the Messiah, on a tree cursed by God. Don't you think they would have taken a moment and said to themselves, okay, may, you know, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe this guy wasn't the Savior. He's here being cursed by God. Maybe we made a mistake. And you know, when you think about the crucifixion and the resurrection, you have to consider that there's, there's only two possible options. Either it's true or it's false. It can't be both, right? If it's true, the way that the disciples react is subsequently is exactly what you would have expected. I mean, if someone had seen the risen Lord, they behaved exactly how you would expect them to behave. Radical transformation, radical preachers, uh, even in the face of death. But if it's false, you have two options, or they had two options. Number one, they could say, okay, you know, we made a mistake. This guy is dead now. We can, let's just drop the whole thing, move on with our lives. At least we keep our lives. Or, number two, you could lie about it and you could say that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, what possible motivation could you have to lie about the whole thing? Maybe the disciples believed, you know, they they believed or they were in favor of this whole religion that Jesus was preaching and they wanted to continue it. Um, But, you know, in that scenario, you could say to yourself, okay, well, you could have just continued the religion through maybe Peter or uh, James or or, uh, John as your as your figurehead, if you want to call it that. You don't have to come up with a story about Jesus rising from the dead. And yet, that is exactly what the disciples did. They chose to boldly declare Jesus having risen from the dead. And they decided to do that even to the extent that they would be horrifically martyred as a consequence. So even death itself was not an obstacle to them. They were so convinced. I mean, we ask ourselves, do we have that kind of faith today? Are we so convinced When we look at these facts, shouldn't we also be so convinced and be willing to even die for our Lord? So consider how the disciples as well, such as Peter and John, were suddenly changed into these mighty, powerful speakers in the public sphere, boldly proclaiming the truth of, uh, boldly declaring the truth of Jesus, even though they knew that they were going to get beaten, they knew that they were going to get persecuted. I mean, Peter went overnight from being the disciple who denied Jesus three times to being the most prominent speaker of the faith. Suddenly his faith just skyrocketed. And again, what was the thing that caused this? And again, we know he saw the risen Lord. Acts 4 verse 13. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. This is where the Holy Spirit had come upon them and empowered them in such an incredible way that they started speaking with authority. So, empty tomb, eyewitness accounts, transformation of the disciples, and point number four, 
the early church. Now, the early church itself stands as profoundly convincing evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Something was birthed in the wake of all of this that has stood for almost 2,000 years now. You know, we're going to celebrate the 2,000 year anniversary of the church soon. The church started suddenly and took hold in such a dramatic way that it has stood the test of time. Despite endless persecutions, despite endless attempts to silence it, despite endless attempts to eradicate the Christian faith from existence, as we even see today. So the church, as recorded in Acts, is deeply, the church history as recorded in Acts is deeply compelling. From a small group of tightly knit believers into a church of thousands upon thousands, performing mighty works for the Lord and bringing people to Christ in a way that has honestly or quite frankly never been seen since. I mean, read this passage in Acts 2 verse 40. With many other words, this is Peter, he testified and exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this perverse generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 people were added. 3,000 people in one day. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen that happen in in a really long time, if at all. So the Holy Spirit came upon them and transformed them in such a way that literally nothing was going to stop them. The chief priests tried, the Pharisees tried, the Romans tried. People have tried throughout history, but they always fail. And why is that? It's because the church is Jesus' bride. He loves her and he cherishes her and he will defend her to the very end. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not just a part of a story. It was the central message. It was the story of the early church. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 15. This is actually the passage with the eyewitnesses in it as well. For I delivered to you, this is Paul speaking, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then there's a colon. So basically saying that this is what I received. He's going to share it now. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So in this passage, Paul is actually referring to a creed that summarizes the early teachings or the teachings of the early church. This includes things like uh, Jesus' burial or Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and the various eyewitness accounts or appearances of Jesus subsequent to his death. So scholars generally agree that this creed dates back to very early in church history, possibly just a few months to a few years following Jesus' crucifixion. So when we consider that Paul himself was converted to Christianity uh, just a couple of years again, or just a short period of time following Jesus' resurrection, probably around 33 to 35 AD, then it's highly likely that he would have received this creed or this teaching from the early church. Possibly on his visit to Jerusalem that we read about in, in Galatians 1, where he actually meets with um, Peter and James, and they instruct him in the core doctrine. So when you think about it like that, it means that Effectively, this message was, and this would have been around AD 36 or 37 when he visited Jerusalem. So this means that effectively that teaching was already so well established in the church so rapidly following Jesus' crucifixion. Isn't that incredible? This is powerful evidence for Jesus' resurrection. It's the same message that we preach today. The same message has stood this test of time. So there you have it, the empty tomb, the eyewitness accounts, the radical transformation of the disciples, and of course the early church, all of which serve as amazing evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Now lastly, I thought it would just be worth mentioning some of the depths that people will go to to try to explain away the truth of the cross. Many people will say, no, the body was actually stolen. But we've already shown how could it possibly have been stolen when there were so many precautions put in place. There was a Roman guard. There was a seal on the tomb. There was a big tombstone in front of it that one person can't move. There was also the fact that Joseph was the one, Joseph of Arimathea was the one who, a member of the Jewish council, the same people who condemned Jesus, he was in charge of putting him in the tomb. So where, where possibly could someone have stolen his body? 
and also consider that the Roman soldiers are not fools. <laughs> when they were told to go and guard the tomb, they would have gone and looked and seen, okay, there's actually, the body is actually in there. They wouldn't go and guard an empty tomb. Some people will say that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but he, he just swooned or he fainted. So he wasn't actually dead. And people who say this honestly have not looked into the details around crucifixion. Crucifixion was, was designed as a way of killing people in the most excruciating, the most painful, the most horrific way. And in the history of crucifixion, no one has ever survived. There was one instance where, it's actually Josephus as well, who mentions it. There was one instance where uh, he saw one of his friends on the cross or being crucified or three of his friends being crucified and he asked that they be removed from the cross. But two of them died and the one did survive but after receiving immense medical attention obviously. So understand that as far as Roman soldiers were concerned, they were experts, they were, designed, they were trained specifically to execute people, to make sure that they died, to make sure that by the time they even get on the cross, they're pretty much on the verge of death anyway. And we see that in the context of the Bible because Jesus was beaten and bruised and by the time he couldn't even carry his cross, by the time he was on the cross, he was already at the point of death and that's why he, he didn't actually take that long to die. So some will even say that Jesus wasn't actually buried, that uh, they, they took his body and replaced it with another one. But again, it just seems to avoid all of the precautions that were put in place and it doesn't make sense. All of these things were in place for a reason. The Pharisees and the Romans were in control of this process. It wasn't the disciples controlling the process. And the worst one is that I've even heard people say there was an excuse made that you know, Jesus actually had a twin, a twin brother, and he, the twin brother was the one that was killed and so Jesus could appear to his disciples subsequent to the, the crucifixion. And I mean sometimes you know when you hear things like this you just have to smile because sometimes when people, no matter how much factual evidence you place before someone, they just aren't willing to believe, they aren't willing to receive the, the message. And in these instances there's precious little that we can do. but. What we can do is we bow down before our Lord and we pray for their salvation because there is no one, let me say that again, there is no one on this earth that is too far for Jesus to reach. There's no heart that's too hard. He can do the impossible, so we trust Him for their salvation. So now as I mentioned at the outset, the importance of this message or the importance of this event cannot be understated. When you consider that the truth of the whole thing you find yourself at a crossroads and a profound life-changing decision lies before you. Jesus died for your sins. He's opened the way to eternal life for you. He's opened the way to enter into the presence of the Father. He's, entered, he's opened the way for you to enter into freedom from the yoke of sin. And now how do you respond? Do you respond, nah, I'm good, thanks. Not for me. I'll carry on living my own life. I'll live for my own purposes. I don't need rescuing. Or do you respond, yes, yes, Lord. I believe. Thank you for this wonderful gift. Thank you for this uh, joy and this peace in my heart. Thank you for this freedom from sin. I accept Jesus into my life and I want to live faithfully for him all the days of my life. What a precious gift it is. And for those of us who do already believe, I pray that this message has given you confidence to share the gospel, knowing that it is true, knowing that what you're sharing is not just a, you know, a, a story or something that you read about, but it's actually real, as real as it gets. So I pray that you've been blessed by this message and share the faith with confidence. In Jesus' name, amen.